Today we're continuing our series that I titled Who Am I with an episode called You Don't Need More. Now it is in the same vein as last week's episode that's uh, You Are Strong Enough with the Lord, but it's a little bit nuanced and because of it, I just really wanted to address it. Hey, it's Amber, wife, mother, type A child of God. Here are little things we look at everyday issues from a biblical perspective with one simple goal, to know and love God more. Thanks for listening. So I think that we run into a sort of common problem. And I think that a lot of us are prone to doing this. So you feel a calling on your life to do something, whatever, uh, start a mom's ministry or a prayer group, or maybe you want to start a family. You know, you've been married for two, three years and you feel the mom urge or so many things, right? Or you're, you see a need in your community. And I hear this all the time. Someday I'm going to you know, have people over. Someday I'm going to have a Bible study in my house. Someday I'm going to do this. Someday I'm going to do that. And I've really been thinking about that lately because I think someday is an excuse which easily becomes never. (laughs) And that's for all of us. And as we look at the examples from last week through the eyes of, do I need more? Did they need more? I realized that most of the people that I talked about from the Bible last week, if they were waiting for more, the more that they thought they needed, they would have never gone. So for instance, Gideon with the Amalekites and the Midianites who were ruling over them, he would have never gone to war because he didn't have enough strength. If he would have waited for the strength that he thought he needed, so if he would have said, okay, God, let me rise, you know, get an uh, an army together let me um, really train them well. And maybe two years from now, we'll be ready for war. Or how about Joseph? I mean, Joseph could have said, I don't have enough influence. I don't have enough whatever to do to get out of this jail. Um, Esther, she didn't feel like she had enough you know, power with her husband. He hadn't even called her for 30 days, which again, when I, when I read this and I look at this, I see how God has so beautifully and brilliantly made sure that we understand that it's not about us and it's not about the more that we think that we need. Moses told God over and over and over, look, I don't, I don't have the ability to speak. I'm, I'm not good with words. I don't think I'm the one to do this. He had all these reasons why he was like, you know, this, this certainly isn't going to work. If I had more, then I would, but I don't have more, so I can't type of thing. Which is all to say that I think our someday needs to quit being used as an excuse. I think we really honestly need to stop putting off the work of God entirely because when are we going to start if not today? People are dying in their sins People are drifting, being pulled in the direction of the world and away from Christianity. So I think we need all hands on deck and we need to quit using the excuse that someday I will because then I will have more whatever and start just depending 100% on God. So I'm going to go to Jesus' own words because these have been monumental to me in the last year. If you've heard me talk about soul care and the worry chapter, I, I it aired on Mother's Day. And even before then, I had taken out in last December, I took out the word worrier from my description at the beginning of Little Things because I started to realize that worrying is not a badge of honor. Worrying is trusting in myself or looking to myself and knowing that I don't have enough instead of looking to God and saying, I mean, you do. So yeah, you're right. I don't have enough, but you do. So let me just not worry because I don't have enough. And let me instead look to you. 
So Jesus said in Matthew 6, verses 25 to 34, these super important words, and I know this is a long reading, and I know that we covered this in the Soul Care um, Mother's Day episode too, but it's for a purpose. This is pretty important. Jesus said, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all of these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Okay, your heavenly father knows. So whatever it is, I love that the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us our spiritual gifts. So for me, for instance, my spiritual gifts are teaching and shepherding and mentoring, leadership, administration, and worship, I think. Um, So the Holy Spirit has given me those things. So then when he nudges me to use them, he's kind of saying, look, I've already given you what you need. So now go use them. And I could be saying, but I mean, I don't have enough energy. Yeah, I know. (laughs) That's where you need me. Your heavenly father knows that you need them. But I mean, life is kind of busy. Yeah. I know because I gave you those kids. So I understand that it's busy because I, I I gave you those kids as a blessing and I gave you that spouse as a blessing. So I know, I know what your needs are and it's okay. Look, there's something that I've seen time after time after time. And it's sort of this strange, ironic thing in God's kingdom. It's much like how God tells us, to test him by giving money to him. He says, test me and see if I won't give you much more. So you give money away and yet God blesses you and gives you more. And it's almost the same with our time. I have worked hard at ministry for years in different seasons. So some seasons were extremely busy ministry seasons. And yet, God just allowed me to have the energy and strength to take care of everything else as well. You know, during those ministry times, my family was still fed. I still managed to get the laundry done. The lawn was mowed. Somehow or another, things got done. There were seasons that weren't so much ministry. So for instance, in my church, um, we don't have confirmation classes during the summer. We don't have Sunday school during the summer. A lot of times our women's Bible study took a break during the summer. So there were just seasons that were less to do. And I don't know that I got anything more done during those times. It wasn't like Every year in May, when everything came to a close, I was like, oh, good, now I can get so much done over the summer. You're still just doing dishes and laundry and whatever the kids are doing. And my point is this, that during the school year, it wasn't as if I could barely breathe or, you know, things didn't get done. God allowed me to have the strength I needed at the time to do the things that needed to get done at home and to teach. And so the irony is that we think we need more of all this stuff. And that's not the way it works. The way it works is that we use our gifts to the Lord. 
And he helps us with everything else. Everything else gets done. Things just fall into place. It's the Lord's blessing on our life. So those excuses that we need, those excuses that we don't have what we need are just that. They're excuses for us to justify not doing the work of God instead of stepping forward in faith and saying, God, you know what? I'm going to do this because I, you've equipped me and I know that you will be with me. So I'm going to step forward in faith and I'm going to seek you. I'm going to seek your kingdom first and I'm going to trust your words that all the rest will be given to me as well. And then watch and see how God does that. I want to share with you a study that I found absolutely fascinating. It was done by two NASA doctors. They conducted a study to test the creative genius of humans. They tested 1,600 children between the ages of four and five. And they found that 98% of them fell into the genius category of creative imagination. So being able to use your imagination to do things, to solve problems, to come up with solutions to things and just think outside the box. Okay, 98% of four to five-year-olds. By the time these kids were in grade school, only 30% of them had this genius level of creative imagination. And by the time they were 15, only 12%. Then when they tested adults, only 2% of adults had creative genius levels of imagination. Now this study conducted showed that our American system of, of education does not really inspire people to be creative. We more have teachers stand up and teach than we're supposed to regurgitate the information back on a test. And if we can do that, then you're a good kid and you can move on. Instead of saying, hey, maybe there are other ways to solve this problem or let's think of this. Were there other things that countries might have done to deal with this problem in history? Can you think of a way? Or could you think of what might have helped? But we don't tend to do that in the American education system. That aside, as I was looking at this study, first of all, I I had to check and make sure that this was real because I thought 98% of four to five-year-olds have creative genius and yet only 2% of us as adults have that, I realize that as a society, we teach people not to step out of our comfort zone. You get in a box, you stay in a box. As long as you're in that box, everything will be okay. And maybe too often Christians fall into this too, of thinking, well, I mean, if I step outside of my comfort zone to do these things, maybe I'll be embarrassed or maybe things won't work out or um, maybe I don't have enough of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and therefore I shouldn't try. And somehow I think we have to get back to where we were as four and five-year-olds to being able to say, well, okay, Here's the problem. The world needs to know Jesus. I know Jesus. How can I, in my little neighborhood of the world, help other people know Jesus? What would that look like? What do people need? They need peace. What do I have? I have peace in Jesus. How can I make sure other people know about this? And just creatively looking at this, It might be, it might mean as you go for your walk at night, you aren't so bent on burning calories that you walk past everybody and you don't think of anybody. It may be stopping to talk to your neighbors. It may be saying, how are things going? And when they're like, oh, this world is crazy. 
you being able to say, I know. I know that the world is crazy, but I knew it was going to be crazy because I'm a Bible reader and I know that God is in control and that's where I find my peace and I pray and maybe we need to start creatively seeing the world differently, all of us. Maybe the things that overwhelm you in life, you need to be able to creatively see them differently. That problem with your child. So often we think the problem is that they're not acting like this. But is it? Is that really the problem? Or is the problem our expectations of how they should act? I have four very, very different children. If I expected all four of my children to be in the same mold, I would be very, very disappointed. The truth is, thanks be to God, through a lot of good Christian advice, unbelievable Christian ministries that talk to moms and have led me and encouraged me, I've come to a point of understanding and appreciating the differences in each of my children and looking at things creatively differently. What one child is doing is not the path the other child should go on. I have one child who just got married at age 21. That isn't the path all my children will be on. It's the path that child is on. And I think if we could stop thinking that we don't have what we need, and if we could stop thinking only of ourselves, but instead if we could approach God creatively, saying, I want to reach the world with your name. How would you have me do that? I know you've given me gifts. Show me what I need to do. And sometimes even that prayer, I just start laughing because sometimes that means we first have to deal with ourselves. We have to get out of ourselves. Like I said, it might mean the difference between walking fast and getting our exercise in and not having, you know, you know, having our blinders in and not talking to anybody versus walking slower, stopping to talk to people, doing things differently. It may mean working fewer hours so that you have more time to do the things that God is really spurring you to do. We get so caught up. I got so caught up. In 2022, I got so caught up in working. I was working like a maniac. And boy, God was good to show me that, you know, you work and you work and you work for things that spoil. And really at the end of the day, what have you done? What have you accomplished? Yes, there were blessings, huge blessings. I'm not saying there weren't. But God was good to show me that money is such a silly thing to work for. Ministry is what matters. People knowing Jesus is what matters. And thankfully, I was able to do both. But my perspective this year is just so much different in terms of stop thinking, Amber, and everybody else. Someday you will do something when you have more. If God needs you to get more of something, he's able to supply it. You know, the Apostle Paul started out as Saul and he did need more of something. He needed a total mind shift. He was completely stuck in his Pharisee philosophy, you know, of earning your way to heaven, of being good enough, of following all the rules, of thinking that the Christians were bad. They were bad. They were against everything the Pharisees stood for. And God stopped him in his tracks and said, you know what, Paul? I mean, Saul who became Paul, you need more of me. You want to know what matters? 
me. I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Um, and so the Apostle Paul was born in that conversion and realized that the more he was after was complete and total rubbish. He said that everything else that I did up until then, it was all rubbish. It's nothing. The more that I thought I was longing for and getting was just worldly. And when you finally get more of Jesus, then all you want is to share it with others. So here's my challenge to you today. Stop thinking you need more. I sat on my desk la- deck last night with four young men. They are just amazing young men. But I sat and listened to them and I'm not laughing at them. I remember what it was like to be, you know, 20 years old. But I asked a few of them, when are you going to get married? Oh, I don't have any money. I couldn't get married. I said, you guys, we got married with nothing. I mean, we didn't even have great jobs. We just got married and we knew God would take care of us and he has never let us down. Don't let that stop you. That's silly. We don't need more. We don't need more worldly. We just need more courage and trust that God will help us. He'll see us through it. Do the right thing. Get married. If you're in love, don't live together. Do the right thing. Get married and ask God for the job that provides. And ask God for the money to pay the bills this month and again next month. And see how he does that in oftentimes miraculous ways. We don't need more of the world. We just need to trust in God. This has been Little Things, because in God's kingdom, the little things are the big things.